Hey, I'm Chris Chandler, one of your pastors here at the Summit Church, and I'm so thrilled that you're joining us today. We're in the middle of this great series called Together Again. I'll tell you a little more about that here in a moment. If you didn't know, we're a church located in Lee Summit, Missouri, but during our time together today, you're gonna to be joined by people from all over the place and have an opportunity to engage with each other through the chat. So make sure you drop where you're watching from below. Like I said, we're continuing in a series today called Together Again. We're all, we're all kind of in the process of returning to a normal-ish type of life, and part of that means re-engaging with others and finding a community here at church that can encourage you and spur you on. Lastly, I want you to know about our four Lee Summit block party. It's coming up Saturday, August 28th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. We're always talking about how we wanna be a church for our community, and this is a great way to show that. So come with your family to enjoy some inflatables, giveaways, we have a caricature artist, we have a game trailer, and so much more. We're also gonna invite some local vendors where you can shop small and purchase some handmade items. So make sure you bring a little bit of extra cash to pour back into some local businesses. Thanks for being with us today. I pray that this time of worship in the word is meaningful and encouraging for you today. Now here's the band to lead us into our time of worship. Be quiet, we 
The milkman, the paperboy, the evening TV Every night at our house, we do something that people think is totally crazy. We sit down together and eat dinner at the table without our phones. I know, it's so hard to do sometimes. And there are times that we eat in shifts and there are times that we may have to eat really early or really late, but we've made it a priority to sit down and share a meal together at the end of the day. And that became important to me sometime along the way after I heard a podcast by a guy whose name is Robert Putnam. He was talking about the decline of socialization in America. I know those are really big words, but basically he noticed something that was incredible. There were more people than ever bowling in the late 90s and early 2000s, and fewer people than ever participating in bowling leagues. He wrote a book called Bowling Alone. And in it, he talked about the decline of people being connected in relationships, whether it's being a part of an organization or being a member of a laborer's union, or maybe it was just being a part of a church family. He noticed that America was changing in a way that was maybe not helpful to becoming the kind of country that we want to be. We live in an increasingly, I'll do it my way and I've got this and I'll go it alone kind of world. And today I wanna to invite you to think about how our lives might be different if we would instead make a commitment to be together again. My name's Ryan, I'm one of the pastors at the Summit Church in Lee Summit, Missouri. And today I have the privilege of sharing with you out of this message series we're doing called Together Again. This is part three. If you've missed the other parts, they're available for you on YouTube. And today we're thinking about the importance of community even in times like this. Now our county is in a mask mandate. And what we've seen happen is that when the mask mandate comes, people retreat to their homes. They go back to what's comfortable and familiar and, I mean, let's be honest, to the places that they don't have to wear masks. And I get it. But today I want to encourage us to think differently about community, choosing to engage in community, even when it's difficult. So today's one of those messages is one of these thoughts that I can share with you that applies to everyone across the board. Whether you're just scrolling along and you happened upon this message and you're like, I don't even know if I believe any of this stuff, or if you've been following Jesus for a long time, the things we'll talk about today about being involved in relationships, about connecting with other people, it applies to you. And there's something I believe that you can learn and take away for the way that you relate to other people. Now there's this old African proverb and you may have heard it sometime and it says this, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And that is so incredibly true. Going together is sometimes more difficult, but the end result 
is so much more worth it. In fact, today I want to drive this one idea home, and it's the one thing that I hope you'll remember after you get done watching today, and it's this. People need people. Today we're going to take a look at a writing done by the Apostle Paul. And it's in the book of Ephesians, and Paul is writing a letter to this group of people. In fact, he calls them God's holy people in Ephesus. This is a group of Christian people. These are the people who have gathered together, who are building the church, who are growing together. And Paul begins to paint a picture for them of what life in community should look like. Now, whether it's in church or at work or in your family, there are lessons to be learned about the way we act toward each other, the way we interact with each other, and it makes all the difference in the world and the way our relationships play themselves out. So today, we're going off to Ephesians chapter 3. You can open up a Bible if you have one near you, or you can Google Ephesians chapter 3, or you can download our Summit Church app, and all the notes will be right there. Let's get started. Ephesians chapter three, starting in verse 14. We're not gonna go very far because we're gonna start with these three words. For this reason. Now, Paul begins with for this reason because he wants to call back to the thing that he just said, the idea he has just articulated. And that idea is this. It's incredibly controversial. It's something that the people probably didn't want to hear, but they needed to hear. And the idea is this. That the grace of God, the boundless riches of Christ, as Paul writes, are for everyone, Jews and Gentiles. This is good news. In fact, this is the good news. But it's also a message that's tough to swallow because Paul is telling them that these two groups of people who are totally different both have a claim to the eternal life that Jesus offers. These are people who dressed differently and ate differently and worshiped differently and all of their social customs were different. And yet he's saying these truths apply equally to all of you. The Jews would have the Hebrew Bible at the center of all that they said and did. They would know the scriptures of the Old Testament inside and out. And Paul says, yes, the message of Jesus is for you. And also it is for the Gentiles, those who are worshiping Roman gods, those who are focused on politics and thought and reason. And Paul's message is a reminder to us that in spite of our differences, we're held together by something that's incredibly powerful. And Paul invites everyone in to this moment. I have a hard time wrapping my mind around that sometimes because I know just how off people can be. For example, I learned recently that there are people who put milk in the bowl before their cereal. I can't even wrap my mind around that. I don't know why you would do that. But on a more serious level, there are things that keep us divided, like questions about whether we should wear masks or not, whether we should be vaccinated or not, things like politics and even sports. But here's the craziest thing of all. Even when we agree that there's a problem, we can't seem to agree on a solution. And so we have an opportunity to enter in to a moment like this and hear what Paul has to say in moments of division for this reason. You can see the gravity of the moment as Paul continues in verse 14. He says, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. See, Paul doesn't stand up in front of everyone and shout at them and expect them to listen. Paul says, no, I got all this stuff to say to you and I'm saying it on my knees. I'm saying it as a moment or an act of prayer on your behalf, asking God that it could be true. But here's the thing about Paul. He's not kneeling in private. See, Paul's writing this letter from prison, chained to a prison guard, Paul is kneeling as he's chained to the man who is guarding him, and yet he is not ashamed. There's no required posture to pray. Paul's kneeling is not necessarily out of the ordinary, but it's not what Jewish people would typically do. But Paul chooses that posture because it says something about what he is trying to communicate. 
Paul is praying a bold prayer from a position of power because of who God is, not because of what Paul can accomplish in and of himself. And Paul's prayer gives us insight into why community is so important. Check this out. Verse 16. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with his power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. There are three things I want to draw out that Paul is telling us about community today. And the first one is this. Community gives me strength. The strength that I have in moments of weakness or moments of trial comes not from me, but from him. It doesn't come from within who I am. It comes because of who God is. And I wonder, have you ever reached a breaking point, a point where you thought, I can't do this anymore? It's too much. I'm overwhelmed. I can't take another step. I can't go another day. I can't accomplish another goal. I can't do another task. Have you ever reached that point where you said, I just don't think I can? I've got good news and bad news. The good news is that he can do it. And the bad news is that you have to submit to him in order to make it happen. We find strength when we feel like giving up. And it's the plot of every movie you've ever watched, right? There's a point at which they need help. They need someone to come to their aid. And there's always someone just around the corner. And though our lives may not play out just like that, there's hope that can be found in these moments, knowing that my community of people gives me strength. Check this out. Hebrews 10, 24. Let us be concerned for one another, to help one another, to show love and do good. Let us not give up in the habit of meeting together as some are doing. Instead, let us encourage one another all the more. The strength that God wants to provide you is coming from someone sitting next to you, someone who's side by side with you. You are made for connection and community. People need people. And it's in this place that we experience God's strength. But God's strength is really just the beginning, verse 17. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and high and deep is the love of Christ. The second thing the community does is community gives me hope. Pastor and theologian John Wesley says it like this. He says, What is the breadth of the love of Christ embracing all mankind and length from everlasting to everlasting and depth not to be fathomed by any creature and height not to be reached by any enemy. The promise of what a community can bring when we are together is truly the stuff that changes lives. But it's also difficult. I read recently this reality, and maybe you can relate. The problem with community is people, right? It's everything would be great if it weren't for all the people around you that make it not so great. And yet those very people are the people that God uses to give me hope. This reminder from Romans chapter one is so powerful. I want us to help each other with the faith we have. Your faith will help me and my faith will help you. And when we have that opportunity to see how we have strength and we have hope in community, we read verse 19 and Paul says this, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. When I'm in community, I find wisdom. Pastor Jim said last week that he knows less at 62 than he did at 22. And I can tell you without a doubt that 20 years ago, I could solve any problem you gave me. And today I would have a harder time solving it because I've lived more and because I know more people who may be experiencing that problem and because I realize the implications of the problems that need to be solved. When we have community, when we're rubbing shoulders and standing side by side with other people, the wisdom that we need wells up inside of us. This weekend, I had an opportunity to live that out. 
I may have told you before that I have a 30-year-old pontoon boat. And because it's a 30-year-old pontoon boat, not everything on it works as it should. And I'm okay with that because I can take my family out and we go fishing and we have a great time. So Rebecca's been very concerned about how much gas was in the boat. And I kept telling her very lovingly, of course, that there was enough gas in the boat, that we don't drive it that much. We just go from here to there and then we use a trolling motor to get where we need to go. And so after three or four times going out on the boat, asking about the gas, I decided that I would take the gas can full of gas that's mixed with oil onto the boat. And I took it out to the boat and I started to put gas in the boat and I was there by myself and I was like, oh, I'll do it when I get back. And I sat it next to the boat on the dock and my family got on the boat and off we went. We made it to our favorite fishing hole. It's our spot. We know we're gonna slay the fish in this spot. And after we got done fishing, I fired up the boat and something incredible happened. It didn't start. See, all of that questioning about whether or not there was enough gas in the boat were questions that we needed to be asking. And so instead of fishing for the rest of the day, we spent um, a good chunk of our afternoon drifting from one side of the lake to the other until we were rescued by some incredible people. And my story of finding wisdom in community may sound a lot like my wife was just right and I was wrong, and that is true. But there's also something to be said for the fact that when we hear a voice of reason or wisdom around us, it's an invitation to listen. It's an invitation to lean in. And when we do, we find the wisdom that community can offer. As you think about growing in community and becoming a part of something bigger than yourself, there are four ways that you can do that, even here at part of the summit. The first one is to make a commitment to follow Jesus, to be involved in weekend worship and to practice the way of Jesus every day in your own life. The second way is to find yourself a community, a small group, a rooted group, a group of people that you can spend time with and do life with. You can find a place to serve together using your gifts and passions to make other people better and you can be for others being invested and connected to everything that happens in the life of the community because of what Jesus has already done for you. When you make a decision to be a part of something bigger than yourself, this becomes your reality. Your growth begins, and in that moment, you become a lot more like Jesus. Will you join me in prayer? God, thank you for this picture of community and the difference it can make. It can be easy for us to walk away from people when life gets hard. God, help us remember that people need people. We're made for community. We're made for relationships. Help us to commit to those relationships that can make us better, that make us stronger, that make us wiser. And God, they help give us the hope that you bring in the person of Jesus. We pray all this in his name. Amen.